Hello and welcome to the Sunday session. I'm Steve Judge, your host for this Football Network World presentation. Um, today I'm joined by three outstanding coaches and authors uh, who will be here today to speak to us about the ideas and challenges behind writing books are about football coaching. Um, before we uh, get to introduce them, let me quickly share my screen with you uh, give you a little bit more information about what you can expect on today's sunday session so in today's ideas and challenges behind writing a football coaching book um, once we get through the introductions i'll quickly share with the guys we'll give you some quick presentations we'll give you an overview on the books and uh, and and the work that's gone into them before we'll have a deeper dive into those challenges about how going about having a having a to get your book published. Um, and moving on with the pros and cons behind going through that process for then sort of getting the guys to share a little bit more on the coaching methods, philosophies behind uh, the books that they've they've written. Um, of course, we always we want to get you involved as much as possible. So with those little staging points in mind, if you use the little Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen to share your, your questions for Ben, Peter and Carl, and we'll get through as many of those through the next hour and a bit uh, with the guys. Um, so, so that we can do that, let me uh, stop waffling on and start introducing you to today's guests. So, we'll start with uh, with uh, Peter. Um, Peter Prickett, how are you today? Very good, thank you. Thanks for having me on. No, absolutely, our pleasure, Peter. Um, I think. Uh, yeah, rather than me sort of go through all of your CV, I'll, I'll let you share that with, with today's audience. Um, okay, oh, love this way to start. Uh, start with where I am right now, working with Brentford FC Community Trust. My official title is the senior coach. Um, I work in, mainly in the development centres and the schools. Uh, I've written three books on coaching. I'm a master's in performance football coaching. I was an FA tutor. Um, I think those are probably the key highlights without going too deep into the odds and ends on the CV. Okay, thanks, Peter. Um, Carl Wilde. Carl, how are you doing today? Marvellous. Thank you for having me on, Stephen. Really appreciate oh, no. it. Absolutely a pleasure. Appreciate you uh, taking the time out to join us today. Um, and likewise with you, Carl, I'll allow you to tell tell everyone a, a little bit about yourself. Yeah, so um, currently my main role is I'm a programme leader at UCFB, uh, which is a university that specialises in, in football degrees. So I look after the football coaching management course that we do there. Uh, top of that, I work at Chester Football Club. I'm the lead coach for the junior section. Uh, and I'm also a coach developer uh, with the FA, so working on the new UEFA C courses. Previously to that, I also did the level one and level two courses with the FA. And various coaching backgrounds. Main one uh, with Manchester City working in the girls program. So I was there for five years and I've worked at other clubs such as Wigan and Crewe and Stoke City and so forth. Um, published my first book last year, uh, just came out last September. Second one's due out uh, later this year, around about August, September time as well. You know, fantastic. And finally, and by no means least, uh, we have Ben Barlow, who seems to be, I think, I believe you're out at a tournament in Woking, Ben. I am, yes. Um, thanks for having me on, Steve. Carl, Peter, good to join you. Um, yeah, I've got the pleasures of, hopefully you've got the pleasures of the background sounds of uh, Goldsworth Park Rangers Under Sevens Festival, which our daughter is... Uh, currently playing in so uh, i hope the background sound adds a nice ambience as opposed to an interference but um yeah ben Bartlett, um currently employed as the head of academy coaching at, at fulham uh, i'm very fortunate across a number of years to have spent time working with some fantastic players some really outstanding coaches and a privilege to had a very varied set of clubs and federations that i've worked at um slightly the slightly the junior in terms of a publishing capacity uh, uh, compared to my peers here today. So first book was published just before Christmas last year. Uh, second one has just been finished, which we hope will be out just before Christmas. So I'm certainly sort of trying to hang on to Carl and Peter's coattails in that sense. Yeah, you're moving moving into that realm of starting to become pro prolific like the, uh, like the other two guys. 
one way of looking at it, Steve. <laughs> Right. Well, uh, we'll move straight into the uh, the presentations. Um, as well, we shall allow Carl to take over as host then for the next five to ten minutes and uh, tell us all about his work. Perfect. Yeah, I've got that, Stephen. Thank you for that. Um, so hopefully, I'll share my screen for everyone to see. Um, and there we go. Hope you guys can see that. Perfect. Okay. Um, so just a quick, I've been asked to give a quick overview of, of the book uh, in terms of, of what the main concept is and, and thoughts and so forth uh, behind it. So when, when I came around to, to, to start uh, writing it, I, I wanted to try and get sort of three sort of key messages across to the reader or to the coaches that are reading it. So I really wanted them to make sure that they actually understood what the game of football or what the game of soccer is and uh, as mad as that sounds, it, you obviously most people know football, but it's just trying to go into a little bit deeper and trying to understand exactly what it is and what type of, of game it is. Um, and then I just wanted to make sure that they understand who they're actually working with, so i.e. the players. And then also to try and get a little bit better understanding of themselves, the coach and, and the role that they play in terms of uh, uh, the players' development and putting on sessions and and their roles once uh, uh, the, the, the sessions are up and running and beforehand and, and afterwards and so forth. So the three main things there, just understanding the game, understanding the players and then understanding their role as the coach. So in terms of understanding the game itself, um, just some key information around it. So just to remind the readers, because they probably know this already, obviously, but sometimes it's just that little reminder and just getting a little bit more detail into it. So first of all, that it is an invasion game. So there's key components of an invasion game in terms of that we need to remember when, when uh, we're putting on practice and so forth. So in terms of directional, um, in terms of trying to get into the opposition's uh, territory, and then once you're in there trying to score, whether that's with a goal or in rugby, try line, netball, basketball, through a hoop, whatever it may be. And then also at the same time, protecting your own territory and, and uh, protecting and defending to make sure the opposition don't score. So that's the main part of, of invasion games. And then into that, breaking that down of what football specifically is, because even though it is an invasion game, like other invasion games, there's, there's obviously specific elements that, that make it football and make it soccer. And then also the different formats in terms of age groups and players playing it. So obviously the younger ones will play 3v3, 5v5, 7v7, whatever format it may be until we get to the full version of the 11v11 game. So then just understanding again, which particular format the players are playing and why that's different to the other formats and why it's important. And then once we've done all that, it's then just really thinking about the impact that then has on your practice design. So when you're putting practices together, just remembering to go always go back to the game and what the game looks like and then making sure that whatever we produce within our practices is something that happens within the game. So we'd ask the question if you're putting a practice. So for instance, I don't know if that constant practice where they're dribbling and out of cones, maybe that's not the best way of doing it because when did he ever dribble in and out of cones? Um, so instead, maybe just put them in an area where they're dribbling around and there's people, other players within the area and they're the actual um, things that are coming across them and getting in the way in, rather than the cones. So it makes it a little bit more realistic because those people are moving, the cones don't move. The cones are in a straight line. That never happens in terms of dribbling and so forth. So it's just those type of things in terms of making sure whatever we produce looks like the actual game. And then the other key component for me is um, the before and after actions. So in terms of if we are looking at dribbling, look at what happens in the game before dribbling and then after dribbling. And then just to make sure that actually happens within our practice designs as well. So if you're looking like a basic 1v1 practice, Usually we have a defender pass to a, uh, uh, an attacker and an attacker tries to get past the defender and then stop the ball on the line. But it's very rare that the defender passes to an attacker in a game of football and it's very rare that once an attacker gets past the defender, they actually then just decide to stop the ball on the line. That doesn't happen. So maybe we need a server passing the ball into the attacker so that's more realistic in terms of the angle it will come from and so forth. And then once they get past the defender, there's another action for them to, to do. So maybe a pass or maybe a shot on goal or whatever it may be 
just to make sure it looks like something that would actually happen within the game. And then the final bit is just remember it is a game, okay? The kids turn up, they always ask to play a game because that's what they play football for. They want to play games. They enjoy that part of it. So try and make every practice some sort of games, a scoring system, opposition, et cetera. And then the next bit was just around about understanding who you are in terms of the coaching, so who you're coaching, sorry. So obviously the players and most of the time for all of us, we're, we're coaching children. So we just need to remember that they are children and therefore they're going to act like children and they're going to want to do things that children want to do. So it shouldn't come as a big surprise to us that if they're putting cues that they get bored and they start to misbehave because they are bored and they want to go do something else. They just want, as we mentioned before in the previous slide, they just want to play games. So put them in that format where it's fun, it's engaging, it's challenging and so forth. And then just remember they're a group of individuals as well. So even though we have a, a, a squad or a team, whatever you may want to call it, of 10, 12 players, that they're actually all individuals within that group. So they're going to be at different stages of the development in terms of where they are in terms of their football uh, development and the different aspects around that development, the physical side, the technical side, et cetera. And throughout the years, that will change. So sometimes players will be in different positions in terms of squad, where they are in, in terms of their development. So we need to try and cater for those needs. We need to case for the needs in terms of why they're there, in terms of how we prefer to learn, etc. So there's, there's a whole load of information around that in terms of supporting individual players. And again, it's just another key, but just keep reinforcing it in terms of that they're there to have fun, they're there to play football. So again, don't or try not to put them in, in situations where they're doing drills or something that's not uh, engaging for them. And then in terms of you as the coach, um, I think the key thing for us, first of all, is just, just remember what you're good at. So it may come from your, your, your other parts of your life. So in terms of your job, in terms of your family, whatever it is, people usually come into coaching and they can bring lots of things with them. So it might be really good organisation, might be really good engagement with kids, whatever it may be. So remember what you're good at, first of all, and that will maybe help you just a little bit in terms of maybe what you need to develop yourself as a coach. I think a key thing for, for me is just, just remind yourself why you're there. So why you started coaching in the first place. And it's usually because you want to work with players, you want to you, you get in, stay involved in football, you enjoy football. So always remember that. Always go into a coaching session remembering why you're there. And then just remember you are a coach as well. So we, we do actually need to help them improve as players. So for, for me, once the practice is up and running, what are you doing? What is your role in terms of helping them and supporting them uh, to help them get better? So is it little interventions with, with individual players or as a group or just giving them challenges that, that will put them in a place that's, uh, that will stretch them a little bit? But what is your actual um, behaviours and what's your actual role once the practices are up and running? Uh, and then... Also, remember that most of the players we're going to work with, even in the professional game, are going to go on and be professional players. So we're not just trying to produce footballers, we're trying to produce, produce people as well. So in terms of habits and in terms of doing the right thing, we're role models and we need to remember that. And then just remembering as well, it's it's a process and it's, it's not a race. So we, we probably start working with them at seven, eight years of age. So we're probably going to have possibly 10 years with them. So we don't have to do everything at once. We can take our time, understand what they need at that specific moment in their lives, work on that, and then just progress as they progress in terms of players. And then obviously, again, we've just got to make it fun. We've got to make it fun for the players, but also we've just got to make it fun for yourself as well. Because if you don't enjoy it, then you're not going to keep doing it or you won't put in the effort that you would, would do six months ago when you were enjoying it. So make sure you, you enjoy it as a coach as well. So finally, just hopefully I'll produce a resource that, that's easy to read and follow for coaches. I've included practice ideas that go along with these key messages to show how it, how it can actually be achieved. And then hopefully it's, it's a resource that, that, that uh, coaches will use and, and keep coming back to. So just to flick through in terms of the book, that's what it looks like. And in terms of what we're into it and so forth, and we'll get into it obviously a little bit later in the, in, in the, in the webinar in terms of how long that took and some of the challenges are faced and so forth. But hopefully that, that gives you an insight in terms of the book. Brilliant. Thanks, Carl. Well, that was excellent. No problem at all. So I'll just stop sharing. Yeah, I wonder if you could then pass the baton on to, to Peter. Perfect, yeah.
bear me one second. Just one sec, I'm having difficulties now. There we go. Ah, yes. There you go, Peter, all yours, pal. Wonderful, thank you very much. Very good presentation that I have to follow. Lovely. <laughs> right. Okay, so um, I've written three books, so I'm going to start at the beginning because, in terms of the uh, a, a, a webinar where we talked about the challenges and the difficulties uh, of writing a book, they did get easier. So if I start on book number one, then the, the challenges are more relevant, especially to anyone who is thinking about getting started with a book. Um, and so the first one was developing skills, which as it says there, guide to 3v3 soccer coaching. The book is built around the small-sided practices three versus three, occasionally dipping into additional players, depending on what you're looking to do. Goalkeepers, magic players, jokers, target players, etc. cetera. Um, the whole point for me is that was trying to increase the number of ball contacts per player, increase the number of decisions they needed to make on and off the ball while giving them freedom to solve problems and the games and practices that are designed the tasks are game related the challenges are game related and the problems are game related too which might sound fairly obvious but sometimes you will see Okay, we're going to do something that's linked to problem solving. The problem or task that is set, it is a problem or task, but it doesn't have much to do with the game of football. And that's something I was trying to avoid. Uh, and I think I'll move on because how did this actually happen? How did I get there? And I, it was the bird, it was Twitter. Twitter, Twitter made me do it. Um, and it, it, it actually did with all three books, and we could talk about that a bit more. But I was working um, with Brentford on a unit of work where we were focusing on 1v1, 2v2, and 3v3. 1v1, fine, not a problem. 2v2, I found extremely frustrating because of the, the limited number of connections that you could have offensively and defensively. And it wasn't enough. It wasn't close enough to the game for it to be more than a snippet. 3v3, on the other hand, gave it a little bit more. So I thought, okay, what resources are there out there? And I, I put it out to the Twitterverse and I got silence. Other than Horse Lane's work, which is fantastic and I will always doff my cap to what he did. But I felt it could go further. I felt that you could get more overall principles of play into the practices and make them even more challenging and even more game related than here's a 3v3 set off, set up, off you go. Made the practices and shared them. Twitter lapped them up. And I got people say to me, oh, you should you should think about writing a book. Uh, no, no, forget it, I, I don't think so. And then after a while, after a bit more encouragement, I went, okay, let's give it a go. Let's, let's see who will take me. So I, I scoured my bookshelves. I looked at authors on there who I hadn't necessarily heard of or weren't particularly big names and who were their publishers. And a lot of them were from the same publisher, which was, Benny and Kearney. So I approached them, showed them my initial ideas, and fortunately, they said yes. They accepted the premise. They felt that there was a, a gap there, and they felt that the content was, was good, and what I was trying to do was beneficial to, to coaches. And 
what I found was by that point, a lot of the content already existed. And I was just mining my own archives, mining practices that I'd used, practices that I created, and pulling it all together. So in actuality, the process for the first book, for me, wasn't that difficult once I was accepted because the content was already there. What I then had to do was create the prose explaining what I was doing and why. And as time has gone on, I found that I kind of done things inside out. I wrote the book first, then I went and did the, the masters. And I found that actually while I was studying, a lot of the ideas around constraints-led approach, teaching games for understanding, they're already in the book, just in a different language. So one of the things that I, I proposed doing was to translate my book from, from what was layman's terms into academic language. I decided not to do it because there wasn't much point, but, it's, but I think it's really interesting that when we have built an understanding of small-sided games, a lot of the academic concepts are within us and we then just have to translate and understand the language. All right, moving on. It was not straightforward. There were various battles from the layout of the book to one place where I got tripped up was that I didn't realize my publisher was going to do it in black and white. So when I have just written descriptions, some of them involve colors, which unless you've bought or picked up the um, digital version, you're not gonna get. The cover was a scrap, change this, make this smaller, make this larger. The ball is too small, the ball is too big. And then the title was a huge fight, absolutely huge from it being called soccer coaching to me wanting a much shorter, snappier title. Everything was a battle at that point. And we probably spent a month and a half just discussing the title and the cover. And looking back, I now can't even remember my suggestions. So how much it was worth the fight, it probably wasn't but I felt like it was at the time. And then success, except one of the first things I was told when I was taken on was just be aware you might only sell a hundred copies of this because you're in a very niche market and there's every chance no one will be interested. Now, within the first year, we flew well beyond that which was great. And then I got other comments like, oh, this is really, this is comprehensive. I'm like, okay, but I've got loads of stuff I didn't put in. So I went to the second book. The second book has not performed as well. And I think a part of that was because it just isn't different enough for people to realize it's a different book. People, I think, have felt that it's a second edition. So there's a lesson there that I need to make a third book if it is significantly different so people just don't think that it's a, another edition of the same book and the same content. But through persistence on social media uh, and being quite busy, as I'm sure some of you have noticed, I've managed to generate sales and get the message out there. And those have created further opportunities for the next book, for Football's Principles of Play, which occurred just because someone on Twitter asked me a question. And I think that this is a, quite an important thing is that you don't know quite where the next book opportunity or the next chance will come. But if you're not active, you may not find those opportunities at all. Um, and yeah, we'll, we'll talk a bit, a bit more about all this stuff a, a bit later, but I thought I'd build, base my presentation less about the content of the actual book and more about the, 
the process as I experienced it. So I'm now going to hand back to uh, Stephen so he can move us on. Thank you. I'll uh, just share my screen. So Ben, just let me know when you need me to flick on and I will move it on to the next page. Thank you very much. Um, I guess the challenge in writing a book is people often want answers. Often people go to a book, particularly a book that's non-fiction, for solutions to problems. And I guess the big challenge is, uh, as you can see in the first slide, is that every different context will probably have a different solution to it. And the judgments that any of us make as coaches will be guided by the things that are valued and important to our club, to the people that are in our club, such as the players, and to the parents that probably bring those players along every single week. Um, so fundamentally, there aren't necessarily a million ways of doing things, but there's probably lots of different ways of approaching principally the similar thing. Um, and I guess that's why the value judgments that we make should probably be nested inside the way that we want the game of football to be played. Because um, in the end, I think like, um, like Peter alluded to, that it is a directional game. We want to kick it in their goal and stop kicking it in ours. Um, and once we've got some clarity about how it is that we want to play, we can probably then organise how it is that we'll coach and what it is that we'll probably analyse as a consequence. And by analysis, I don't just necessarily mean data and video. It's probably just a means by which we reflect on whether or not we're doing what we said was important, which kind of takes you back to the value judgments bit. And we might value in a particular context winning every single game and beating the opposition. And I guess um, certainly social media can be really good at creating dichotomies about things that are good and things that are bad or things that are right and things that are wrong. Um, and I don't necessarily know it's a bad thing for a team to state that they want to win every single game. I think it's probably just important that they're clear about that and ensure that the decisions that we make align to that and allow the players and the parents to make their own judgments about whether that's a club they want to be a part of. Um, and the analysis part is the final part. It's probably really important just to keep us sort of consistently checking whether or not what we said was important is actually what we're doing. Um, as moving on to the second slide, please, Steve, hopefully the really important element about practice design, about game design, and certainly in the youth development context, seeing practice and the game as one and the same thing. I guess things like kind of tactical periodization have perhaps um, ended up emerging in youth development when we talk about things like match day minus one and match day plus one and shaping our practice as a consequence of what happened on the game. Uh, and whilst we should probably be conscious about what happened in the game, we should just be mindful of the fact that the game is just another practice opportunity and trying to ensure that we see it that way rather than seeing it as something that's separate. Which fundamentally means those three sort of points there on slide two just talk about um, two teams, two goals and one ball. Um, and that's not a, an absolute, that's not a rule, but just a principle from which we start. And obviously anything that we do as a consequence to regress things from that should probably be as a consequence of what we saw when we were watching the game. Uh, the second element that's in that is that as much as possible, try and nest the things that are important to the team and the things that are critical to the individual inside every single practice which perhaps moves us away from working on a theme basis to say today we're working on plan out from the back or today we're working on dribbling towards recognising that if we use two goals, two teams and one ball, um, we've got a better chance of embedding more than one principle of the game of football alongside the things that are important to the individual so that multiple things are occurring at the same time and consciously being attended to by both the players and the coach. And the third element is probably just to encourage coaches, certainly in our context, to stay in practice design and practice organisations for longer. Because I guess historical and certainly coach education has been guilty of shaping this, where you spend 10 minutes in a technique practice before you move to a skill practice for 10 minutes, before you run a small-sided game for 15 minutes, which historically when you were doing your level two was how you pass. And if you spent 15 minutes in your technique practice, you're often criticised for the fact that you didn't move along to the next practice type quickly enough. Uh, and many of those kind of historical constraints shape the way that coaches think about coaching. Um, we should encourage the coaches to stay in practice designs for longer and just layer in complexity over time, which means players can spend more time adapting to understanding what's going on and shaping their behaviour as a consequence, rather than consistently having to learn another practice that the coach thinks is important to put on. Um, I think if we can possibly then move on to the third slide, please, Steve. probably then a recognition of as a consequence what sort of things we put into our programme um, and the programme should probably be shaped by again the things that we value that perhaps we feel are important at any particular moment in time. Um, it's probably critical to really be clear about how it is that we're going to shape those things 
as a consequence of coming to understand the things that are important to people. So hopefully in front of you at the moment, you'll see a, a, a sort of quote or a statement. Um, I'll not read it because I'm sure you're all capable of reading yourself, but I guess many of the things that shape the way that we think about football coaching syllabus or curriculum are guided or historically have been guided by the way that we think about school, um, which is perhaps mistaken. So in school, you go to a maths lesson for an hour, you get taught by a particular teacher and then the bell rings and you go to a different class and you perhaps learn about science for an hour. And often those subjects are then subdivided into sub-subjects. So you're going to learn about Pythagoras or you're going to learn about chemistry. Uh, and then at the end of that, you'll take a test. And if you pass that test, you're deemed to have learned and understood what's important. Um, and whilst that may be a really good way of navigating the school system, I think it's mistaken to just impose those systems on top of football and coaching, soccer. Um, so the way that we would largely see a syllabus is just a consistent response to the people that are in front of you, guided by hopefully, as stated at the outset of the presentation and the introduction of this slide, the things that are important to you. Um, and not feeling the need to say, this week we're working on subject A, and next week we're working on subject B, but this week we're working on developing the way that we want this team to play, and we develop it in league with the things that are important to those individuals. And the more that those things are consistently evident in the work that we do, the more likely we are to support learning. And perhaps in some senses, learning needs to be reconceptualized from terms that are quite common in the academic literature about things like acquisition and knowledge towards things like development and growth so that we see it as a continual process of evolution as opposed to something that we have to remember for a particular moment in time. If you could possibly move on to slide four then, Steve, which the risk is that, I guess, if we just ask people what's important and we use quotes like we're in the previous slide, it can be quite abstract and really difficult for coaches to decide what's important. So the book supports coaches to navigate some of the different ingredients that we might mix, making some conscious decisions about how it is that we design the architecture of the practice and the architecture is designed is organized sorry into three p's which is how do we organize the players understanding what we understand about them how do we pitch the practice what shape size pitch do we use and how might we parameterize the area to enable some things to happen more than others and hopefully on that slide four you'll see different small pitch wide pitch top right is a narrow pitch and bottom right is a larger pitch and just recognising that by using different pitch shapes and sizes, we enable certain things to happen more than others. The literature would call it affordances, that by making certain decisions, it affords the players opportunity to practice some things more than others. We can then also distribute the players relative to that. So you'll see at the bottom a relatively straightforward three versus three, which hopefully, as Peter alluded to uh, with his book, doesn't mean that because you go to three versus three that you lose some of the perceived tactical benefits of playing as you may do there with a number nine and a number 10, working out how to combine plus a centre half and a holding midfielder. So even though you go to smaller numbers and perhaps I think as Carl alluded to, you get more touches on the ball, people receive the ball more of the time, you're not trading off some of the tactical benefits that are occurred during the traditional game of football. So the architecture is important. And then also the demands, which are perhaps some of the more explicit things that we furnish the architecture with, which may be some conditions. And you'll see through that slide, the sort of allusion to the, to the three R's, whether or not you reward a particular thing that you think is more important on any given day, such as at the top left, where we reward double goals for scoring from across. And important to recognize that the architecture, the design and the demands are reciprocal with each other. So by having a pitch that's wider than it is long, the ball should spend more time going wide by rewarding crossing with two goals, uh, sorry, goal scored from across the two goals as opposed to any other goal uh, being valued as one. It just enables the, sh the, the shape and size of the pitch and the demand that the players are encouraged to consider to work together to hopefully increase the amount of crossing and finishing that you get whilst not necessarily only repeating crossing and finish at the cost of every other element of the game. And the important thing, I guess, for, for, for me to try and put across, for the book to try and state is that on any given day, we should just make conscious decisions about the design that we integrate alongside the demands that supports players to learn the game of football and recognize that when we go from a small pitch to a big pitch, whilst some of the architecture and even the demands and the furnishing may change, hopefully the principles that underpin the things that we value at our club and the things that are important to those individuals are inherent in every single piece of work, whether that's a training session or a game day. And if we work coherently and in partnership with other clubs, with other teams in our league, there are opportunities to run some of these things on a game day. We haven't got to be bound by the dogma of committees that it takes to us that the pitch should be 60 by 40, the goal should be mini soccer, and every single time there's a restart, the player should retreat back to the halfway line to kick off. 
some of those things are important conditions and valuable learning opportunities for the players. But arbitrarily exposing the players with the same game exposure every single week, perhaps, are things that we can challenge. And final element to just finish is the final slide, which is just, I guess, my research. Um, and I guess in many senses, the research has tried to challenge the sort of traditional way that academia has built research, which is largely just a continuation of the way that school has functioned, which is you have to narrow something down to a particular subject to study it. The challenge with sports like soccer is that it's got a complex set of conditions like offside, like goal kicks when the ball goes off the end of the pitch, like trying to score more goals in the opposition, which are consistently in tension with each other. And you've also got a collection of different individuals and their human systems, what might be perceived as the four corners, although perhaps that's a mistaken way of thinking about the human body. All of these human systems are integrated together. And the risk is, is when we research stuff, when academia research stuff, it tends to separate. So it says, let's, uh, let's consider the psychological characteristics of this. And the risk is, is that you create seams and cracks in a system that didn't have those seams and cracks. And after you've separated them and put them back together, they end up looking like a patchwork quilt which is not the same thing that you started to look at before you dissected it, cut it and pulled it apart. Um, so in every sense, my research just seems to look at any given context, what's important in that context, and trying to support coaches to align what they do with those things. That hopefully means that the book is just a collection of different stories, which I've been fortunate to experience through my career, which was in this context, these things were important at that moment in time, hence they led to us doing these things. In a different context, different things were important. Hence, we approached it in slightly different ways and recognise that context is probably king or queen and not content. That's me, Steve. I'll stop rambling and let you carry on. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. We'll move on now um, to the discussion between between the three of you. And so, yeah, as um, Peter sort of alluded to in his presentation, going right back to the beginning, that beginning of that first book, and I guess with that first, that first, Seed. Um, I'll let Carl pick up on that and what you sort of heard with Peter's challenges with his beginnings. Um, and, and how was it for you, how that first idea sort of seeded itself and you know, the challenges that you then faced in terms of how do I then develop that into a book idea and, and getting a publisher who will who'll take that on? Yeah, um, my, mine came back slightly differently in terms of it, it came out through some of the roles I was taking on and currently still am. So I, I sort of found myself eventually in, in quite a coach educational role in terms of all my jobs. So with the FA, UCFB, and at the time I was working at Man City and I was, I was um, the, the foundation phase lead for the, for the girls section. So I was supporting coaches in, in different ways in terms of practice design for, at Man City, in terms of just starting the coaching ladder and coaching journey with the FA or UCFB. And I sort of found the messages I was giving were, were getting quite well received off people and, and they, they found it uh, helpful and so forth. But then later on, if I came across these people again, sometimes what we'd spoke about and what they wanted to do hadn't materialised. They were sort of referring back to where they were previously. And the discussions around about it was we just needed some sort of resource that they could refer back to to, to help them. So obviously the, 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 the main type of resource at the time would, would be a book. So I had this idea, so I thought maybe I could get some ideas down and maybe maybe get a book going. So I just tried writing a couple of chapters just to see how I could actually do it, first of all, uh, and just to see what it looked like and whether, whether I was happy with it. I just wanted to make sure whatever I produced, I was happy with as, as well. So two or three chapters in, I just sent it out to a little bit like Peter, had a look at my bookshelf had a look at different publishers that were available in sort of the coaching sort of world, sent it off to three or four, didn't hear back off some, got rejected off some, and then eventually did get 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 uh, the go-ahead off one of them, which was, was my own mayor sport. So once we got that and that approval came through that, that they were interested, it was just then a matter of, of going on and, and, and doing it. The biggest challenge for me was... I was happy writing stuff and putting it all together, but I'm a bit of a perfectionist, and I'm sure the other guys are. And I just every time I wrote something, I had to keep changing it because I wasn't happy, like with one sentence or with how it's structured and so forth. And it was it, it took a while uh, until I was happy. But even though even then, you know, you look back at it and you think, oh, why did I write that? Or why the like Peter mentioned before, why have I missed that part out and so forth? Um, so that was a real challenge to me, just just getting something that you're happy with and, and think will be useful for, for anyone who, who purchases it. So 
but that, that was the main process and it, yeah it took a while but you know, I, again it's, it's very worthwhile if you can do it and if it's something you're interested in I'd, I'd definitely recommend it to, to anyone um, likewise with yourself Ben um, where did that first seed of an idea and sort of plucking up I don't, I don't know whether courage is the right word to to go go for it and uh, and and put these ideas on onto into print yeah i guess i was really fortunate in the sense that um i was approached by the publisher green star media who produce elite soccer soccer coach weekly women's soccer coach rugby coach weekly and many other publications um and i suppose fortunate in the sense that his view was that the market that they had were very much very much a market that liked practices that liked magazines that had a lot of practices in them um rather than necessarily encouraging coaches to think about what might be most appropriate to their context so I was fortunate I didn't have to sort of pitch for the type of book that I thought I might write. I almost had a willing audience that says, look, we think there's a space in the market for this. Would you like to write it? Um, I was also fortunate, I guess, some of the mumbo jumbo that I had published previously through articles had landed with this particular publisher and he almost wanted to build a book as a consequence of those pieces, which I think it was um, Peter alluded to saying that almost he had the library of content previously. And I guess most of the content had just come from my lived experience. And as much as possible, trying to just get that down on paper, but trying to, in some sense, be supported to organise that in some way that might be perceived to be coherent, that somebody else could look at, make sense of, and hopefully use some of those experiences to inform the things that they may choose to do for themselves and with their players. Um, I think the biggest challenge was getting it across the line in terms of having something that would have market value while still having something that was the book that I wanted to write. Um, which had some real tension because I guess the, probably in the soccer coaching world, the football coaching world, there probably is still a thirst for give me the practice book, show me what the recipe is for Wednesday night. And for probably 85 to 90 percent of the coaching market, they're probably volunteer part time or grassroots coaches that just want something that will get them through the hour with the kids. That hopefully gives them an opportunity to build some understanding of useful practices over time. It gives them a greater sense of competence at coaching. And I guess it's trying to ensure that the book provides enough of those kind of examples that people can go to a recipe in the event that they want to, but can also have wrapped around that the guiding context that supports us to make those decisions as to why we do what we do. Um, I think like the other guys alluded to, I think the recognition of how much um, thirst there was for that kind of content has really just been quite overpowering really in terms of, and a bit overwhelming in the sense that I never really imagined that as much interest will be generated from the book as it has, um, which has been, yeah, really motivating and hopefully just a, a, a nice opportunity, as the other guys alluded to, like from a personal perspective to, I suppose, there's the element that if you want to learn something more deeply, teach it to others. And I guess that aspect of having to spend time organising your historical experiences, put it into something that is coherent that other people can read, has been really valuable personal experience to help me develop deeper and, uh, and perhaps personal clarity as a consequence of doing that particular piece of work. I think the probably nervous part of it, or the two nerving parts, unnerving parts, sorry, of it, were the first one was just before it went out, that real, that real sort of anxiety about if this bombs and people think it's absolute garbage, this is effectively my life's work, everything that's in there, all the things that I've lived. And there was certainly some real sleepless nights about if this is perceived to be absolute mumbo jumbo. And I'm sure some people have thought it's that, but largely it hasn't been seen as that. Um, and it's probably a, a, a sort of damning indictment on the way that I've chose to, chose to spend my life. And I think the second one is now when I pick it up and look back at it, almost the element that, and I think Rene said it kindly in the foreword, that you look back on it six months down the line and actually realise that if you were to rewrite it, you'd write some stuff differently. You'd put some stuff in a different order because it's just a continually living, breathing thing that even though you thought it made sense when you wrote it, knowing what you now know is slightly different from what it was six months to a year ago. Yes, Ben, yeah, there's uh, plenty there that we can jump into and, and, and have a, a deeper dive into as the discussion flows. But um, Pete, just wondered that, and as Ben said, Ben was probably lucky in this instance that not having to go through that pitching process. And I just wondered if you could share a little bit on what that is like, how you have to organise that. I think yourself and Carl both identifying publishers to pitch through was basically just looking at books in a similar field and, and finding out who the publishers were there. And, and then was that just a case of cold calling these people? Yeah, I mean, that, I was quite lucky. I didn't get a knockback. I think that my, my process of narrowing down 
who I was going to really meant that it gave me a great chance to succeed. So I emailed them, um, outlined what I was doing, and book on 3v3, small-sided games, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I told them the whole reason that I came up with it myself was because I couldn't find anything else out there. They then did a cursory search. They found a 3v3 book that I'd never seen in my life, but it looked absolutely awful um, and very amateur, incredibly amateurish. Finally, they didn't find any of Horst Vane's work, which is surprising, but that work was quite old and hasn't been, hadn't been built on for quite a while. So it was an empty marketplace. And because of that, they said, yeah, we're happy to go. I showed them everything that I had come up with. And then it was a very, they guided me through the process. And we talked about structuring the book and how that might look and what might help the reader. Um, and I was like, okay, I know some people struggle with warm ups. So let's put a section in there about warm-ups slash arrival activities and how we might go with those. I'm a big, big advocate of 1v1 activities. So let's put in some 1v1 activities and, and then we'll go into the 3v3 practices. And then I'll put in, I put in some more practices that break those rules of being 3v3. It's still 3v3 in the actual active area of the game and I might be being disrespectful to goalkeepers we're in that regard not necessarily including them always in the active part of the game it becomes more 4v4 or 3v3 plus keepers and then outside players bounce players waves and that sort of thing but the main theme is having those three active players um, just to keep it all together and then the final part of the book was a discussion that we had was how might you actually use it in practice so i think some people will have had this experience of here's a book with all of these activities in how do i put it together how do i actually take what's in here and deliver a session from these so i then gave several examples of what it might look like um, uh, I also will say that I made sure to say these practices are templates, adjust them to your players as required. And I also ensured that I said, I am not telling anyone to only use 3v3. And I will never tell anyone only use 3v3. But be aware of all of the benefits that you can get from it. And just by reading this, consider it to be a part of that classic term that has been used by um, the FA for a while, a part of your toolbox for what you could potentially deliver. Doesn't mean you do it all the time. And I was quite careful with that because there are some, some people who are absolutists out there and they say no it has to be like this and I think that when you do that you've got more chance of alienating people than actually getting people to listen to to your message because it, whether you're an absolutist or not your message is still going to be a part of many other messages and then it's up to the individual to go actually yes I the evidence and the argument is strong, I'm gonna start using that. So I'm very careful in the language, especially in book one and book two. Book three is a little bit different, but we might, we might or may not talk about that later. All right, we probably will. But um, Carl, um, did I I'm just make sure I heard this right with you? I, so Peter sort of seems to have struck gold with his first pitch, but you had one or two not backs. Did yeah. I hear that correctly? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I had a couple of I had a couple of publishers either just not respond to me or, or come back and say, no, we've already got 
authors on our books or on a book, as some may say, on our books already in terms of having similar sort of content, maybe what they saw, similar sort of content in terms of football or soccer coaching and, and didn't feel the need for uh, somebody else to come along and, and join in with that. So, yeah, definitely had a number of knockbacks. How's it then you then persevere through that, Bedeem? You know, as you were a first-time author, I mean, if you already had books, you'd probably be already be aware of the process and it's probably easier to punch through. But as someone who'd not written a book, how do you sort of like keep going to understand, well, actually, I do have something here and believe yeah. in that and keep knocking on different doors until you find someone who says, yeah. Yeah, I think it's just that, there's that, that belief in you. Like I say, I decided to go down the, the, the process of doing two or three chapters first then just pause it. I thought, I'm not going to, because I don't want to self, I didn't want to self publish at the time. I thought, if I'm going to do it, I, I want to be recognized in terms of somebody else seeing it as a, as a per, personal piece of work. So I thought, I'd go down the route of doing two or three chapters just to make sure I could, like I said before, that I could actually do it myself and have that belief in myself to do it. But then also for, for somebody else to have a look at and think, yeah, you're onto something here. So once I've done those two or three chapters, I was happy with what I did and I, I, I could see where the rest of the book was going to go. And I could, I could see because I, I, I have contact with a lot of coaches in, in grassroots through my different roles, I could, I could see it being really beneficial for them. I could see a need for it compared to, to what else I'd, I'd read out there. So in terms of uh, that resource where they could keep referring back to, and it wasn't just giving them a, a load of practices and off you go and put them into place. Like Peter said before, they're just templates. It's more about the understanding of why you're doing this particular type of practice and what the benefits you get from it. Again, a little bit like Peter and, and, and Ben have come across, uh, spoke about with their book. So I really did think it was it was beneficial. Asked a couple of colleagues that I work with to, to have a flick through as well, and, and they reinforced it. Uh, I don't know whether it's been kind at the time or not. I don't know, but um, hopefully not. Um, so I just kept just kept trying and just sent just tried a couple more. I think I was literally down to probably the last two uh, of people I could uh, publishers that I could find that I thought would 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 have a go at it. And I was just looking whether it's luck or whether it's the right time. They were just looking when they came back to me. They said they were actually actively looking for people at that time for football coaching in terms of sort of grassroots sort of um, areas. And so I may have been just at the right time, but, but I contacted them as well. But yeah, it's like anything in life. I, I like to think again, things don't come easy. You, you have to work hard for them, uh, but you get your benefits if you do that. So, uh, yeah, just get plugging on at it. Yeah, fantastic, fantastic. Um, ben, um, with your your book, you mentioned that so you had the fortune of a publisher coming to you um, on the back of of articles that you'd already already written, or at least you'd you'd have the practice of writing various articles about your your coaching experience. So I just wonder when it came to writing a book. Was there that approach different? Did you find it different from writing articles to now sort of writing them as a longer form in a book? Or did you take the approach that I'm just writing a lot of a lot of articles all in one go? I guess it's that balance between a book, a book of short stories and a book that tells a longer story over time. And I guess as much as possible, it was trying to organise that into some kind of coherent order, but principally starting with the end. So where is it we want this book to go? And as a consequence, what are the stages that we want to take people through? And I guess my aspiration was that the book was going to be about learning. Um, that doesn't mean it isn't about coaching, but coaching is really just a tactic that we may use at any moment in time that supports people to learn. So the book's about learning. As a consequence, if we think it's about a learning environment, design is probably really important. Um, and once you get into the environment design stuff, we can start talking about practice design. We can start talking about coach behavior. We can start talking about how we understand the players. And perhaps moving away from the kind of tradition of player profiles, which says this is the number four or number six, as the continent is now calling them. These are the things that they should be able to do. But more say, Steve Judge is this type of person. He brings these things to the party. He cares about these things. So as a consequence, how can we ensure that the way that we set the team up keeps a harmony between the way that we want the game of football to be played and the things that Steve thinks might be important on any given day? But also not be wed to that, to recognise that Steve's a human being that changes over time, but also changes from day to day. The way that Steve presents on a Friday might be different from the way that Steve presents on a Monday. And as much as possible, being fluid, um, keeping that, that, that stuff in healthy tension with the things that we tend to organise. Uh, and the other thing that I was keen to get into the book, and I guess this probably comes from a lot of my own personal and practical experience, is that at times coach development has been separated from player development that the coach has a development action plan as some of the, our leagues in England would call it. 
which says I want to be the academy manager, I want to be a first team coach. And whilst those aspirations are natural and should be supported, I think we need to be really careful about having coaches that are working on their own pathway and doing it at sometimes a consequence of the things that are important to the player. So as much as possible, the book's encouraging coaches to recognise that the things that they're developing should be done in league with the player. And fundamentally, if we can get really good at responding to the players, whether we end up coaching the under eights or we end up coaching the first team in the Premier League, if what we're trying to do is understand what's important to people, attend to those people, both through the way that we design practice and the way that we organise the team to play, then hopefully we'll keep a relative harmony going throughout one season across numbers of seasons. Um, Peter, um, I mean, you similar to to Ben there, you said your, your first book, you know, the, the, the content was already there and you were, because it was a case of just linking it all together for, for a book for that, for that layout. So I wonder then how your process is, how they've changed with con with subsequent books in terms of how you've gone about writing or your writing style, the way that you've sort of set yourself down to work. Has that remained the same? Um... I think it's the second book occurred because people said to me, this first book, fantastic, it's really comprehensive. And my immediate thought was, you should see all the stuff that I left out. So that's how book number two happened. Again, I had more, too much content. So I, my, my archives were, were massive. So I had been really very selective with what I put into the first one. And then the, for the second one, I'm like, well, actually, so a lot of this is still really good, still really fits in with, with the concepts um, of giving opportunities to players to play, those, those affordances, the the adaptation of the task or the challenge because of the constraints that you use, whether those be environmental constraints or, or, in, or player const or task constraints, and moving the, literally moving the goalposts. So there was enough content for a second book without having to create even more. It was on book number three where things had to change. And really, book number three should have come first because those principles of play are actually what underpins book one and book number two. That's why I created those books because I felt that within a very small-sided game, we could still tap quite deeply into the principles of play and the moments of the game. And it's been mentioned, there is an undeniable thirst for practices. And if we really wanted to, we could just keep knocking out book after book after book of practices and practices and practices with no context, with no reasoning behind the practice. The reasoning behind the 3v3 book was because small side, really small-sided games, look what you can do with minimal numbers. That's the point of them. The next book, the Principles of Playbook, I actually wanted to write a book that was 40 to 60 pages long that a coach could pop into their pocket. A little handbook for the coach who was a relative beginner simplifying the game conceptually that they could tap into at any time they wanted now the publisher and i had a little clash there they said we can't we can't publish a book like that that is that small we need to expand it so i did and it wasn't a big problem but it ended up with practices in it and actually the original book that i came up with there were no practices so the final section of the book, although I've spoken to people and they said, no, it doesn't feel like an add-on. It, genuinely, it was an add-on. It was an add-on that said, 
here's some examples of how each principle can be represented within a practice. So that was a different part of the process. And it, I think it also shows and underlines just how strong the desire for practices is, but in a book that I intended to have no practices, still ended up having practices in it. I mean, on, on, on the back of that, Carl, I mean, all three of you have alluded to the idea with the books that you want, you want them to be guys that ultimately that, that if, you know, coaches can take and then they can build upon and evolve those practices themselves, help them to, to design their own practices on their own. But it still seems like you say, Carl, that the, there's that very strong, it seems to be a strong market out there for coaches who can just, Here's a ready-made session that is, I think, as uh, Ben put it, you know, if I'm just coaching on a Wednesday afternoon, I can just write, let's do that. Yeah, 100%. I mean, I think we have to remember that, I think both Peter and Ben spoke about it already, a large proportion of coaches uh, in this country and in most countries are volunteer coaches working within the grassroots section and they're volunteering their time to, to, to go and support these players in a grassroots environment. So, you know, we, we have to take our hats off to these people, first of all. And that's one of the reasons, again, I'm sure everyone's tried to support them in terms of these, these resources that we've produced. And it is as much as we want to say, look, sit down, every single player and every single group of players are different. And we need to put on practices that are relevant for them at that particular moment in time. It, that's a hard process and that's a long process. And, and people just haven't got the time to do it, unfortunately. Uh, people are busy in terms of their lives, in terms of family and work and so forth. So as much as we want them to do that, it, it, the reality is that they can't always do that. And therefore, when we're pro providing practice ideas, that, that's for them to sometimes, look, they may just need to pick that up and take it with them to, in, in terms of their training environment. I think what all three books will probably say is that, that even though that once you've got that initial practice, can you then just change it, adapt it ever so slightly just to meet the needs of the players? That might just be, if we look at the step process, it might just be the size of the area that they use, the task that the players are being asked to do. So in a professional environment, if we look at a basic rondo sort of practice, instead of completing five or six passes, it might be for this group of players just to pass, uh, complete two or three passes, or there might be an extra player in there. So it's 4v1 rather than a 3v, whatever it may be. There's, there's the actual basis of the practice. This is the type of practice that we're asking you to put on, whether it's 3v3 or the, or the, the, the conditioned games in terms of vendors. But then just try and make those slight adaptations to it and then hopefully it will meet the needs of the players that are actually within it. Um, but like I say, the reality is most of these coaches do need that help in terms of ideas and planning resources to help them because they just literally haven't got the time to do it. And Ben, uh, in your presentation, you kind of alluded to some of the, uh, the kind of core principles that you like to have, keep in mind things that you like to have in each of your session designs. I just wondered if you could build upon those a, a little bit more so that if you know those key elements that you'd like to get across to your readership of your book, that right, if you want to go ahead and design your own sort of sessions, these are nice sort of starting building blocks. Yes, it's intended to sort of work in layers and the sort of deeper that you get into the layers, probably the more the structure is decided for you, the higher, not higher level in terms of being more able, but the higher level in terms of being more abstract that you work from, perhaps the more work you've got to do to get things how you want them to be. So I think as was just alluded to by both Carl and Peter, that balance between helping people have some stuff that works for them versus providing some platform that supports them to design their own stuff. So the first, the sort of highest, most abstract level of it is the four Ds, which is that the practice will have direction. So I'll be invading some kind of line or goal or target and the opposition will be doing the same, which hopefully just means the inherent laws of soccer are evident in the practice, trying to score more goals than the opposition scores. Uh, the second D is that that practice will have definition so it will largely be organized into the part of the pitch that those things are most likely to happen so if we were working more on getting the ball into wide areas it may be that the pitch is located in the final third of the pitch the pitch has got greater width to it than it's got depth to it which just means that as a natural consequence of the shape of the area and the part of the pitch that it's defined in it and enable those things to happen more than others uh, the third d is that those players will have decisions to make which means if we are trying to encourage 
people or afford them greater opportunity to practice crossing and finishing, that they're not only practicing crossing and finishing in exactly the same context all of the time. So it isn't receive off of my back foot, whip it from the side of the box. It might be that those crosses and finishing opportunities present themselves in a variety of different ways. Uh, so that there's uh, direction, there's definition, there's decisions, and those decisions present themselves in different ways. As was alluded to in the presentation, the subheaders of that are then the design, which is the architecture and the demands that we place upon it. And those design are organized into how we organize the players, how we pitch the particular practice or game, and then how we parameterize it. The consequence of that is then the demands that we may align to those organizational conditions, such as whether we restrict, whether we reward, or whether we encourage the players to relate the decisions that they make to the situations that they find themselves in. And the book provides like a table of constraints, which just combines those things into a range of different ways that you could organize practice. So hopefully it works from top level principles right the way down to exact examples of the way that those things may play out. And likewise with, you, with yourself, Peter, I mean, you, you've, you've got books with lots of sessions in there, but if there were you know, people looking to evolve those sessions, what would you still say? What are the core principles that you should, think should still be in, in those sessions, no matter how people look to evolve them? Oh, um, well, there we go. We're starting to head towards absolutism in a way, aren't we? Um, look, when, I, when I'm designing uh, a practice, uh, ben has talked about this as the, as the beginning point within his his book context and, and so Carl you also mention it in your presentation context is is the absolute key um, you've got to start with who it is that you are coaching and what you know about those players and from there you can then go right this is where we're at whether it's we're working from a curriculum, okay, great, I know where I am in the curriculum, or whether you are working on last week, this week, and what happened in the previous game or games, and what you are trying to do. Are you trying to develop the player as a whole, or are we trying to get results, or are we trying to do somewhere in between? depending on the age and age and stage as the, the classic phrase goes. So you've got to start with the context. And then I will always try and make the practice as game-like or as game-related as possible. It may be that I start with, say it's an attacking-based practice, a greater number of offensive versus defensive players just to get some success going and then amp it up and amp it up until it's almost a game where it's equal numbers and then change the rewards and the constraints to help encourage what we're doing or it might be that we're at a stage where I might want to start with just like no it's just 6v6 and it's going to be straight in with the constraints and we're just going to go for it because they're, they're at a, a place where they don't necessarily need that much success but we've still got that option to go back to it if we need it so at, at the heart of what i would try to do is if the opportunity is there to make it game realistic that's where i'm going to start Um, likewise, for yourself, Carl, I don't know you were piggyback on the back of that. Yeah, I'll just copy everyone else, I think. So, yeah, it's, it's quite similar in terms of um, that, that, like we mentioned before, relevant for the players, and it's got to be game realistic, it, uh, an absolute must. One of the other things I'd, I'd chuck in there just for myself is I hope we always try uh, and make the practices a, a pose, not necessarily a pose, but some sort of uh, interference within the practices. So whether that is direct opposition or whether that's, as I mentioned before, in the dribbling uh, sort of context where there's other players dribbling around the area and they may just get in the way rather than just getting them to go in and out of cones. I think Peter mentioned before, and obviously Ben's practices absolutely have loads of decision-making in it and loads of freedom within it. Um, I like to try and provide options and scoring systems. So in terms of that, 
you can get one point for doing this, but you can get two points for doing that. And then it just then helps players who are at different levels in terms of the practices. So if they're not quite as confident, they might go for option one, which is the easier option where you get the one point, but the ones you need challenging a little bit more. If you do this afterwards or you do this before, you're getting an additional point. Uh, and it just challenges them a little bit further, or if the other ones will have a go at it as well, and then maybe jump back to the one point version, you can. So I think that, that's really important for them as well. I and mean, then, as I mentioned earlier as well, that, that before and after action, uh, I think is key. So whatever we're concentrating on, whether it's passing, finishing, whatever, think about what happens just before within the game and think about what happens just after the action. So don't miss those parts out within the practice. And that, that'll help with the realism in terms of putting them in a situation or an environment that when they come to play the game on a Saturday or Sunday, whenever it may be, that they recognise that, that, that picture. So they recognise where the ball's coming from, they recognise what's going to happen in terms of how a team might defend or or the type of movement that a player might make and then think about what they've got to do afterwards as well. So I think they're probably the key ones for me in terms of the type of practices that, that, that I like to try and put on. Well, started to start rounding things up. Um, we'll probably look at the pros and cons of that writing process, how that has impacted on, on yourselves as coaches. Um, We'll start with the cons. We'll get the negatives out of the way so we can end end on a positive. So, uh, Ben, what have been the what have been the real chores of going through this writing process? Which you know you have to do it, but in an ideal world, you prefer it if if you didn't have to. Um, I don't know that there's any distinct like negatives. I guess there's just probably quite a lot of anxieties that you just contend with going through the process, and I guess many of those anxieties are. I guess like many other elements of your life, like is, are people going to like this? Is this going to be any good? And I guess whatever it is in your life, at some point when you show yourself to a group of people, there's a fear that a percentage of those people wouldn't dislike you, dislike the content, dislike what you offer. Uh, and I guess as much as anybody can be being relatively comfortable with the fact that you're never going to appeal to all of the people all of the time. And you're probably a little bit vanilla if you do appeal to all of the people all of the time anyway. Um, so I guess contending with that anxiety and I guess the other thing that's sort of anxious about is ensuring that when you explain stories from your past, that you sort of remember them as cleanly as any of us do, because in, undoubtedly all of these things are, are being, uh, perhaps interfered is the wrong word, but certainly being influenced by the emotions of things that have evolved over time. So when you're, when you're you know, I guess, regaling stories of 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, and you're, even though not in name, talking about players or coaches that you've had the fortune of working with to ensure that you do that justice. And that if any of those people were to pick it up and read it, that they feel that it's a reasonable reflection, that you're not writing something to try and glorify or make it seem more magnificent than perhaps it was. It's just a recognition of these are some of the things that I've experienced over time. These are some of the people that I've been fortunate to share those experiences with and perhaps some of the ways it's made me think about coaching for the future. I just wonder what you say you're dealing with those anxieties. I mean, who... Who are you leaning on in terms of helping you through that, particularly going through the process for the first time? Is it simply just your old book editor or you have sort of colleagues, friends who you would show work to and, you know, and then only ask them to specifically judge on certain aspects? Yeah, certainly the uh, publisher was a great help. Um, I was fortunate in the sense that there was a number of people that publisher thought it was keen was keen to sort of interact with prior to the book being published. Uh, and we tried to get a real sort of breadth of people, people that are working in senior football in some of Europe's top leagues, people that are working in grassroots football, people that are influencing other people through their coach development work, to try and sort of say, look, we hope that this book has got some universal value by sharing it with people that have got a lot of experience to say, you know, do you think this has got value for you or for your peers? Uh, and if it doesn't, what sort of things would you be adding to it? So you're most effectively kind of, I guess, kind of like uh, test driving it before it goes live. Uh, and whilst you'll never manage to capture every single demographic of society, hopefully you just get some sense of the things that are important. Uh, I think the other thing that was helpful about that is you've almost then got some ready-made reader sort of, um, I don't know that it's that advice or necessarily even kind of like um, positive comments to say, but just certainly some perspectives on what the book says and does, which means if people are toying with whether or not to buy the book that I've written, Carl's book, Peter's book, and many of the others, hopefully they can make a, you know, an informed judgment about whether what they're going to be spending their hard-earned money on is actually going to give them what they want it to. And if, if 
through reading those things, they decide not to buy it, then I think I'd probably prefer that rather than sort of blindly go into something that they don't know that they're getting. And likewise, Peter, it's been the it's been the real chores of going through this process. Besides battling over over what the title's going to be, there's I, I'm I'm currently working on a book right now. Um, well, I'm working on a couple of books right now, but I'm in the middle of the editing process of this one, and that is an absolute chore because it's you're doing what you've done three times already for the fourth and fifth time so that is absolutely one undoubtedly a chore um otherwise i mean i suppose linked with what what ben has said once once it's out there you get you try and get people to support you to say hopefully nice things to and and help promote the book which i've been very fortunate with but then the next stage is we need some reviews and the reviews are great and then every so often you get that bad review that comes in and human nature of course we we zero in now Interestingly, the criticisms of, of my book, one of them was um, one review where gave me a one star review and they said it would have been five stars if it had been in color. Well, I'll live with that. Uh, another one for the free, the first book was it was a bit too simple for whoever read it. But that's again, that's fine because my aim was to simplify it. And the same with the Principles of Playbook. Principles of Playbook, I recently got a two-star review saying, good read, but nothing you can't get on social media. I'm like, again, that's fine. Yes, of course you can get all this, but my aim was to put it all into one place so you don't then have to go and hunt for it. So reviews can be a, a very much a double-edged sword. Um, it's great when they, there are reviews that come in that say their review is exactly the reason why you wrote the book. And that's fantastic. But then you get the other reviews and it's like, yeah, okay. But you, I think I've learned over time to make those, make those into something. I now, I think I probably sh more share the bad reviews than the good reviews. I put them out there and go, oh, well, and make, a, make a bit of a joke of it. Because as, as you're gonna, everyone's going to say, you can't please everyone, and nor should you try and please everyone. Because if you try and please everyone, you end up pleasing no one. Um, and one other small, small regret, or regret, I suppose is not the right word, but one of my ambitions amongst all of this is to get one of the books actually on those bookshelves in, in Waterstones. Um, I thought the principles of playbook might do it, hasn't quite. So that's something for the future. I mean, as well as principles of play is done, I've still got a little pang going, oh, I should really be on those shelves. But, you know, if I'd done that, then I would have nothing else to aim for, I guess. And uh, likewise, for your, yourself, Carl, what is. What had been the bane of your existence while uh, going through the writing process? Um, yeah, very, very similar to, to the other lads. I think it's that, it's that concern about how it is going to be received, whether whether it is worthwhile doing, and whether people will enjoy what you've put together. And like like the lads have mentioned, you, you're never going to please everyone. And fully understand that. It, it, you just want to make sure that hopefully the majority of people do actually enjoy it. Like I say, because again, people are spending money on it and purchasing it. And so you want to make sure it's a, it's a product at the end of the day that, that they're happy spending their hard earned money on. So there's a lot of anxiety around that. And ben mentioned before about sleepless nights and there is, you know, you, especially when it comes to the, the about to be published, you, you are really concerned about it. Um, the other two for me, I don't I mentioned it before. I, I'm, I'm just never happy. So I'm just constantly going back and changing stuff and it 
it causes you, yourself a nightmare in terms of once you because if you change one little section and all of a sudden it impacts other chapters and so forth and you just think it so it, it's finding that that time where you're just going to say like, i need to stop here and this this is it this is what i've got to accept this is the final product this is what i've actually produced and it's really difficult because again because you want to produce something that, 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 you, that you think's as good as it possibly can be so you have to be a little bit strict with yourself in terms of that so i think that that's really difficult and the other thing that i found really hard and peter mentioned it before in terms of looking for some help when it comes to actually getting it out there and i hate going to people and asking them just to, to, to put a tweet out for me or do a review for me i hate doing it i hate asking people to do it i, I find it really awkward but again it's just the only way because you just need to get it out there so people not necessarily because you're trying to force it down people's throats, but you just want to make it out and say, look, this is available. And if it, if it is for you, then maybe it's worthwhile purchasing. Hopefully it helps you. So, but people never know about it unless you do publicise it. So it's an important part of, of the actual process. I just found it an uncomfortable part of it because just the way I am. So, yeah, that, that was really tricky for me. Obviously, there's a very good reasons why you keep putting yourselves through through this then. Um, Peter, what does... I mean, in terms of yourself as a as a coach, I mean, going through this process, how has it impact you as a coach? What have been the positives that you've had in terms of how you now approach your coaching practices? I was just going to say, though, um, over time, I've learned to have no shame, guys, when it comes to um, if if you follow <laughs> follow me or seen my activities on Twitter. I'm not afraid to put it out there because you have to and you just got to have no shame because every single time you share info, it's gonna, it has the potential to be new for someone else. So although one person might have seen it 40 times, one per, another person, they're seeing it for the first time. So, yeah, just, just got to learn to have no shame and just do it. Otherwise, we might only sell 100 copies. Um, as for my actual coaching, it's not, I don't think there's been anything really positively beneficial, which is might be weird because it's not anything that's new. It, this, this is, these books are things that existed within me anyway, so I'm putting them out there. So I'm exposing, as we said, exposing ourselves and our, our inner workings to other people. So nothing really new has come of it. One maybe negative that has come out of it is that because of what I have written, there is an element of, well, if anyone's watching me, coach, well, he's the freebie free guy. So surely he should be delivering freebie free right now All right well it doesn't work like that <laughs> you might you might get some freebie free stuff going on at a certain session but it's not going to work that way as i have said myself don't use it all the time because i'm not using it all the time <laughs> i'll use it at certain times or depending on the age it might be a majority of the time or if it's a session that is deliberately set up and pitch as come and play free v free yes you will get it then but it's created a little bit of an internal thing with me but yeah people now expect to see every time some free v free you see uh yeah, you're the first coach i've heard of like you like you're having in the acting world you're being typecast it's uh <laughs> well, I'm trying to avoid it, and that was the good thing about the principles of playbook. It got me, you know, um, away from uh, the comedic roles and into more serious acting. <laughs> uh, for yourself, Carl, um, as a, in terms of a coach and understanding you, yourself as a coach, how how's going through this process of writing a uh, sort of help crystallise that. Yeah, I think I think the actual process of writing it that helped me just reinforce what my principles were in terms of my coaching philosophy and so forth. It helped reinforce that and 
maybe dig a little bit deeper into myself in terms of how I coach or how I want or perceive myself the way I coach and so forth. So I think it definitely helps. I think it helps as well because it it well, it forces you to 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 read more as well. So obviously we all read anyway, but obviously I want to go make sure again to produce what's right. So I'll go and read other other like um, journals and papers to get some ideas there or other books and so forth. So I think it helps you learn there as well in terms of the actual process. And I, that, very similar to what Peter said there, I think then it, it puts a bit of pressure on yourself when you're coaching or like in my a lot of my roles, coach head. So in terms of with my role at UCFB, my role at Chester, in terms of I, I've then got to deliver what I preach. So I, I say not necessarily in terms of as tight cast as Peter is with his 3v3 maybe, but the, the type of practices that I do and the way I deliver them and, and my behaviour in those practices, obviously if, if someone's read the book, you don't know who's watching or who you're delivering to. You, you, you've got to make sure that you, you follow those, those rules. And it lets me up again, I'm sure the lads will agree, it's, sometimes it's hard. We, sometimes we have we don't have the best sessions that no coach does. And depending on what happens on, in, on the, previously in the daytime or how the players turn or whatever, sometimes we don't, it doesn't go as well as we'd hope so. And there's always, again, there's always areas to improve in terms of your coaching. So it, it's difficult, but you're just trying to make sure. But that's a good thing as well, because it makes you prepare yourself correctly in terms of, I'm sure we do anyway, but it puts a little bit more emphasis on that preparation time to make sure what you're going to deliver is as good as you possibly can, not just for yourself, obviously for the players that, that are in it. So, yeah, it's, it, I'd say it's definitely helped me with my coaching. It's, it's helped reinforce, like I say, the philosophy in particular in terms of how what I go about things. And for yourself, then, have been the pros for yourself? I guess principally similar to, um, to Carl and the 3v3 guy. Um but um, I think one of the big positives that's come out of it is certainly if I go back in my own mind, at least sort of 12, 15, 20 years and a sort of games based constraints led approach to coaching was pretty unconventional. And the perception is that it's still pretty unconventional to some. I think if I've, I guess in my own mind, if I've tried to play any role, it's trying to just disrupt what is traditional convention towards something that's perhaps perceived to be a little bit more human, whether that's in player development or whether that's in coach development. And, I guess the benefit of a book that goes out that people read that hopefully generates some level of traction is that it just takes hopefully another step towards those things being less unconventional, less left of field, left kind of pushed away to the corner and something that is just more embraced by many people. Um, I think the second, certainly something that was really powerful for me was when you get feedback, whether it's through social media, whether it's someone that writes a, a review, is people that understand what you meant when you were writing what you wrote because you, you know, you'll write something and people will naturally and rightly interpret it through their own eyes. Uh, and they don't necessarily interpret it in the way that you intended, which isn't right or wrong. It's just people come at stuff from a different perspective. But it's when people say stuff like, I understand what you were doing there, or I came to understand this, that you kind of just sense some commonality, which I guess in all of us, that kind of connection to other people, they don't necessarily think the same as we do, but perhaps understand what we're trying to, uh, I guess, purvey and, what, and, and say when we commit to stuff. Um, probably the final bit that's probably been most powerful for me is the opportunity to tell the story as I remember it. And I guess as certain things have become more common, uh, certainly for some of the work in the Federation, there's, there's an easy way and perhaps a more powerful way for some of those messages to be narrated. I'd like from a personal perspective to at least tell things as I remember it. It's been something that's been really opportune for me. Beautiful. Lovely. Thank you, Ben. Again, just to wrap things up then, finally, guys, I think you've all mentioned you're either working on or have books coming out soon so i just wondered yeah if you wish to share yeah stuff that you uh, currently have going on in terms of your work in publishing yeah yeah, yeah. yeah I've on that if you want. um so yeah a bit like peter mentioned before i tried to, i've done a second book which, which is due out august time so try to make it different to my first book so it, it, it it's maybe for a different reader or people who enjoyed the first work might want to do a bit different. So I've gone down the concept of uh, 10 core practices uh, and then these core practices can be adapted in different ways. So each one can be adapted nine different ways. So from 10 practices, you go to 100 practices and the concept is putting them in the same environment and just making tweaks to the practice. You can go from dribbling to passing from then from passing to defending. So the concept is that 
the players know the practices. So when they turn up each week, we're not spending two, three, four, five minutes trying to get them to understand the practice. We just tell them what the practice is. We can call it after a, a player's name. So it might be the Ronaldo practice or the Messi practice, whatever it may be. And then they go straight into it. So they're spending more of the time in the practice learning. We just change a slight rule or slight condition or slight uh, task within it. And then they're working on a different concept and from passing to dribbling, to shooting the following week, whatever it may be. So again, he's going to that concept of giving uh, coaches ideas of how they might want to work, he uses practices. And again, they don't have to then plan every week. You can maybe just take this particular one and it will just need be a matter of changing the dimensions or the rules slightly. And a bit like Peter said before, we're not saying these are the only 10 practices you'll ever need to use again, but they're there if you want to build them into your curriculum or use them as part of your, of your training. So, yeah, hopefully, hopefully we'll, we'll see how that goes in about right August, September time. Come on, Peter. No shame, you said. Um, well, I'm working on two books at the moment. Um, I think, just going to say, it's really interesting that the three coaches you've got on here, but I think it's safe to say we all would have what would be described as a games-based approach. So we talk about commonality. You're drawn in three with quite similar um, ideas in, in the way they work. Um, and I think one of the great things about having a games-based approach and using the game is that when players come into training and you're telling them what to practice, most of them know what a game is. So you don't have to spend less time explaining what we're doing. You're playing a game. Um, and book number four, I've gone back to typecasting myself. I've written uh, another three versus three book. And interesting that Carl mentioned, we call this the Ronaldo practice or whoever. These are player themed practices. So 3v3 player themed games, highlighting whatever the core attribute or key attribute of a particular player is, and then incorporating that into free games or free practices based around that player. Um, book number five, which I'm working on as well, is very different. It's not a coaching book when it comes to football. It's um, more of a review of past events plus a flight of the imaginations. So we take something that happened and if it had happened slightly differently, what then might the world of football have looked like? That's early 2023. And then there's plans for other books. So yeah, that's, that's where I'm at at the moment. And Ben? Yeah, um, I think the, the second book's written. Uh, I'm just going to go through the sort of editing process to hopefully get it out there in the autumn. Um, I think it's probably more of a sequel, uh, but probably more on a police academy route than Lord of the Rings, unfortunately. Um, I think the, first, you know, the, the aspiration is that the first book spoke probably about sort of broad principles of what, under, what might underpin why you do what you do. Hopefully the second book explores those to a deeper depth. The first book spoke about being a vision for player and coach development. The second book talks about being the craft of player development. Um, and there's a greater analysis of trying to, the book's called Connected Coaching, uh, and it really tries to encourage coaches to sort of eschew the traditional sort of practice spectrum, the playbook, the four corners, the separation of stuff, and more connecting everything that we fundamentally understand into absolutely every core and cell of our being and embody it through every single football experience that we design with and for the players. Um, and as much as possible, trying to move away from the practice spectrum says, I'm working here, but the players need and feel that these things are important. That's as much as possible responds to those things. The second thing that it attempts to do is to sort of delve a little bit more into that analysis part that was referenced the early part of the presentation right back at the beginning of this webinar, which is trying to help people understand and commit to measuring what they value rather than valuing what they can measure and trying to see measure and sort of reflection as being something bigger than just the numbers, but also recognising that whatever it is that we commit to capture should probably be a reflection of what's important so that we don't get sidetracked by something as simple as XG or a chronic acute, a chronic chronic acute workload ratio 
all of which have probably been well-intentioned aspirations to try and help us better understand and objectify football, which is something that will never be wholly objectified. And we're at risk of trying to machine learn soccer, uh, which perhaps is better suited to other things that are less human and less dynamic. Fantastic. Fantastic. Well, cheers, guys. It just uh, leaves me then to, uh, yeah, once again, thanks, Carl, Peter and Ben uh, for coming, joining us here on the Sunday session today and, and, and sort of sharing their insights into writing books and the, the coaching philosophies behind them. Um, and thank you all for joining us today. So until next time, thank you and goodbye.